That's what we as every nation walk together as one tribe, one spiritual family united around one vision to go and make disciples. The Lord God of all creation is extending an invitation to all of us today to come into relationship with Him.
is worthy of it. God, you are worthy of it all, Jesus. God, we thank you because that is who you are. You are our provider, our redeemer, our restorer of souls, of hearts and minds. Jesus, we make room for you to move this morning. We lay down our lies, our doubts. Jesus, we acknowledge and we understand that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Take control of every single heart, God. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence to move in a mighty way. Amen. with your presence. Shake up the ground of all my dreams. 
church, sing it out to him. To do whatever you want. To do whatever you want. Oh, oh, and I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. We want to make room for you. We're crying out to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Fill us with your presence. Be your head. 
like you, O Lord, among the gods. Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. For the Lord is a mighty God, a mighty King over all the gods. Come, let us bow down and worship Him. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Holy Father, we bless you. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're about to do. We give you praise for the miracles and the testimonies we've experienced. We thank you for the ups and the downs. We thank you for your ever abiding presence. Lord, we are gathered again today to hear your voice. For the voice of God is quick and powerful. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord discovered the forest. The voice of the Lord is upon many waters. Father, let your voice penetrate the darkest hearts tonight, this morning. Let your voice penetrate our difficulties and our challenges. And as your word is preached, let lives be saved. Let burdens be lifted. Let hearts be made new. Let families be restored. And above all, let your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you have your seat, please look to your left and to your right. Welcome someone to church. Tell them we're excited to have you here today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. going on Lake Mary Church family thank you so much for choosing Lake Mary Church as your time of worship this Sunday we are glad that you chose Lake Mary Church and I would like to first start off we really hope that you find Lake Mary Church a place to where you can cast your roots really deep and that you can call this your home would you please stand with me as we begin reading from Psalm 23, reading from God's word, if you're, if you're able and if you're willing, please stand. And you know, this psalm is a, a very powerful psalm. But let us begin by reading Psalm 23, one through six, and it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs and overflows. Surely goodness and love 
will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the reading and the hearing of your word. Your word is the star. It is the star of the show. That, Lord, that it is all about you. And that, Lord, we thank you that you are the great shepherd, that you will provide, lead us, and guide us, and protect us through all life's battles, through all life's turbulence, and everything that we could ever possibly go through. We thank you. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we are continuing in our series, I Am, and this is the last day of this series. We're going into the new series next week, Forgotten Virtues. It's going to be fantastic. You have a lot of speakers lined up. But the name that we're going to look at today is Jehovah Rohi. And it actually means the Lord, my shepherd. How many can here say that the Lord is my shepherd. Like you can really make that personal. Like that's a personal Psalm. And you'll see throughout the Psalm that King David actually wrote this and he made it about his relationship with the Lord. And before we get into Psalm 23 and really kind of digging into how does this apply to us today, I want to first just kind of help settle a debate. There has been a debate going on for a long time, and now I would just like to go ahead and settle it for good. And so yesterday at uh, Lucia Community Church, I was shocked on how many people picked one side over the other side. And so what I would like to ask you today is in the NBA GOAT debate of who is the greatest player of all time in the NBA. There's two people up. I already see the the tension. There's some people that get ready to shoot their hands up. How many here say, I know the true greatest all-time player in the NBA is Michael Jordan? Just raise your hand. If you think it's Michael Jordan, just raise your hand. Online, you can go ahead and raise your hand too. If you think, okay, all right, what about LeBron James? Now you're like, no, not Michael Jordan. LeBron James is the greatest NBA. Yep, you lost again. You lost, but that's okay. You know why? This is why it's okay, because it really doesn't matter. They're both extremely talented. Both LeBron James and Michael Jordan, they are truly gifted at basketball. And so when you see this number 23, you may think if you love basketball, Michael Jordan. Man, Michael Jordan is the greatest. Or you might think LeBron James. But dependent upon how you view the number 23, I want to give you a different perspective. That every time you see the 23, I want you to recall Psalm 23. That I want you to be able to recall the greatest shepherd of all time. The greatest man that could ever walk the face of planet Earth. That has to do with Psalm 23. See, it's interesting when you look at two, you know, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, who do you think is better? But I saw, I found this article and last year they wrote this article about Michael Jordan and that Michael Jordan's last year net worth was 1.6 million. Oh, it's billion. I'm sorry. 1.6 billion, not, not million, billion. Then I looked at, let me fact check myself for 2024. You know how much Michael Jordan's net worth is in year 2024? 3.2 billion. Do you know how many churches you could plant with 3.2 billion? Man, we could flip the whole world upside down for the gospel, couldn't we? LeBron James' net worth is uh, 1.2 billion. And see, what's interesting that when you look at, it really doesn't matter which side you land on. They're both extremely talented. I mean, Michael Jordan's shoes alone, my goodness, they're expensive. <laughs> right? They're expensive. I, I, I would never going to wear them. Why? Because I am not paying that much for a pair of shoes. I'm just not going to do it. Last year, his pair of shoes that he wore in the NBA Finals, the second game in 1998, do you know how much these shoes someone paid for? Shoes. 
2.2 million. Now, what are you going to do with those? I'm not wearing them. I'm going to lock them up in a safe, bury the safe six feet under, and I'm just going to leave them there. 2.2 uh, million for a pair of shoes. Jordan's famous line. I love this quote by him, by the way. It says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeeded. Doesn't that sound like life? Doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like your life? Like you go up for that, that job you really want, you put in the application and totally missed it. They don't want you. See, LeBron James revealed something in this really cool interview. This interview that he did, he said last year he broke one of the records of all time in the NBA. And he, this is what really caught my attention. He said, I was not trying to break the record. He says, I believe in the pass. He says, I believe in the team, that there's no I in team. And he says that I always want to make sure that I'm empowering my team members to know that we're in this together. So he was not expecting to break the record, but he broke it. And when in this interview, he starts talking and he starts talking about how when he was a little boy in poverty, that he needed some type of motivation or some type of inspiration to find outside of himself, out of his local context, because of the poverty he was in and where he was trying to go. And he said that he loved sports, so he started to look at the sports people in his time, and he said there had to be somebody that was paved the way even before them. And he came up with three athletes. One of them was King Riffey Jr., the other one was Deion Sanders. And guess who the other one was? Michael Jordan. He says that he looked to these three people to inspire and to motivate him. That this is something that no matter when you see LeBron James stats or Michael Jordan stats, it really doesn't matter the stats that they have because they both have an incredible record. I mean, look, when you look at these stats, they're incredible. They're both extremely talented at what they do. Does that mean that every time that they shoot that they get it in the hoop? No. Does that mean that they've lost some games? Yes. You know, what's interesting. We don't hear about their personal lives. You don't hear about all the personal storms that they had to walk through to get to where they're at today. See, a lot of people, everyone has like this North Star mentality, if you would, in a person or a system or some type of value that gives them hope and direction. This is why we read books. This is why we, read to, uh, we listen to other sermons. This is why we try to find inspirational quotes to help us and to push us to keep going when we're really going through what we're going through. See, who do you find inspiration and love from? Who motivates you? When life gets hard and it gets difficult, who do you run to to inspire and to motivate you to keep going? What are the missed shots or the games that you have lost? What are they? Because sometimes, you know what we like to do? We like to put on a smiling face and act like it's all okay when really inside it's painful. That we have a hard time removing the mask and saying, this is actually me and what I'm going through because of the hurt and the pain and everything that we've been through in our lives. See, 
LeBron, James, Michael Jordan, it doesn't matter. This is one thing we have to keep in mind when we're trying to remember one thing, and this is one thing I wanna leave you with. If there's one thought from this whole entire message that you can walk away with, I'm gonna give it to you right up front because this is the all-time thing. Instead of being like Mike, who holds world fame, here's your greatest takeaway. Be like Christ and abide in his name. That don't be like LeBron James who holds world fame or Steve Jobs who is known for business or whoever fill in the blank. Don't be like them, be like Christ and abide in whose name? His name. Because it's in his name that gets me through what I'm going through. That when I am down and out and I have nowhere to go and everybody seems to forsake me or nobody can really lift me up out of what I'm in, that I can look to Christ and abide in his name and he lifts me up out of my valley. He lifts me up out of my pit and then I can stay focused on the one true main thing that David writes about, the Lord is my my shepherd. Not that I think he is. He is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Is he your shepherd? Is he? Can you actually sit here and say that when everything has gone down at night, you lay down your head on the pillow? And all the storms of emotions that are going inside you and you don't know how you're going to pay the bills and you don't know how you're going to get to this next part of your life. You don't even know if you're going to graduate because you're trying. You're looking at all this turmoil and pain. But when you lay your head down at night, the one thing that comes to your mind is the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. David begins his psalm by giving you the whole conclusion of the whole psalm. He could have sat there and said, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing, period, done. And then he's going to detail it out for us, what it means. He's going to detail out his life, why he is making this statement. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Some of you are like, oh, Travis, we're going to talk right after service because I lack a lot. I'm going to show you my bank account. But it's not what's in the account. It's who's the controller of the account. Because if the shepherd is in control of my finances, if the shepherd is in control of every aspect of my life, I don't lack nothing because the shepherd is with me. It does not matter what comes up against me. It does not matter about the fear that is before me. It does not matter about all the heck that I have to walk through. The difference is, is that the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing because he's with me. That statement you could just live the rest of your life with. But the question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because I'm going to tell you right now, life will really get you to reflect and to, wit to draw out what you truly believe. Because when the storms come rolling in, what's in you will come out of you. That if you really believe that he's your shepherd, it is not saying that you're exempt from storms. It is not saying that it's not going to be hard. What he's saying is, is no matter what I go through, no matter how bad it smushes me, it's going to come out of me. He's my shepherd. And I'm still going to trust him. I'm still going to walk with him. And no matter what, I will not deny him. Because he's my good shepherd. And you know what's really cool about this psalm? David was a shepherd. When you look at David's life, it's fascinating because, man, he was messed up. And if you don't know, let me just summarize it. He was adulterer. He was a murderer. He did everything bad. And yet God still say he's after my own heart. I'm like, how in the world could you make that statement? But his heart was so right with the Lord that even when he knew he messed up, that he would always turn to the shepherd for guidance, for repentance, for forgiveness. 
That does not mean that life is going to be full of this great life of, of abundance and I'm never going to have an issue. Because that, that steals away from us trusting the shepherd. How do we learn to trust him now if we don't have to go through hard times? Jesus was persecuted. Jesus went through the most roughest times. See, to be a really good shepherd, you have to know your environment. I used to think shepherds were lazy. I'm just gonna be honest with you. The picture that I had in my head about what green pastures look like, I said, yeah, it's easy to have sheep. Acres, hundreds of acres of just green pastures, and then the sheep, you just watch them and they just eat. They just eat. And the shepherd just stands around. Back then, they didn't have cell phones, so he's probably just sit there with the shepherd just counting the flies that are flying by. It just seems like you just, that's what shepherding was about? No. That's maybe what our Western mind has in mind, but that's not what a shepherd had to go through. Shepherds had to really know their environment. And actually, where, where they were living, that farmers would not allow sheep or goats to come into their farmland because sheep, if you know anything about a sheep or goat, they'll annihilate the whole land if you let them. And so the, the farmers would push out the shepherds all the way back to Abraham's time. And they were forced out into the desert in the Judean wilderness. And that's where they had to abide and that's where they had to live. Well, what's interesting about that in the desert, and especially in Midbar, which we'll get into in a minute, that there's a lot of predators out there. So the shepherd had to know about the lions, the tigers, and the bears, oh my, because they were a threat to the sheep. They even had to know the vegetation that was around them because there was certain vegetation that was poisonous to the sheep if he ate it. So the shepherd had to know his sheep. And you know what's really cool about the sheep? The sheep follow the shepherd. That the sheep actually know the voice of the shepherd. See, the Lord is your shepherd providing for all your spiritual and physical needs. There is not a need that he cannot meet. There is not a me that he cannot provide for. And sometimes what we feel we need is actually what we want because he truly knows what you need. And the sheep have unbelievable trust in their shepherd. They know that they're gonna follow his voice because they know that the shepherd will provide for them at all times. Now, this verse too, he makes me lie down in green pastures. One day I would really like to do this for a demonstration. I wanna get a sheep, put them right here, and I want someone out here to try to get in there and wrestle the sheep to lie down. I want to see that so bad. It would be so hilarious. That would, maybe we'll make that thing go viral all on Facebook. Because you can't make a sheep lie down. You can't. You cannot make a sheep lie down. You can't. So what was David trying to tell us when he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Well, the first thing we have to understand is pastures do not look like this. They don't. Now this is when I read the text, green pastures. How many here actually say, yep, that's what I envision right there, green pastures. That is not what David's writing about. It will shock you. See, because green pastures was actually a place called Midbar, and it's actually in the Judean wilderness, and this is the green pastures. You ready? Boom. Now, can someone please tell me what is green about that? Does that look green to you? No. But do you see the dark, like, yellow spots going right around the rocks? Do you see that? That's the green pasture. That's what David was writing about. See, David, during this, in this region, what's happening in this region is, is three months out of the year, a lot of rain, a lot of rain. Nine months out of the year, that's a 
yep. Nine months out of the year, it looked like what you just saw. Three months out of the year, it looks like this. This is what it looks like. So how do sheep survive? Because when I saw the picture before, I was like, man, sheep eating rocks. <laughs> how are they surviving? How? See, what's really cool is that when you look at the history, and especially what's going on right now in the region, even to this day, the Mediterranean has a really cool breeze that comes over, especially in, like towards the evening. And because of the humility, uh, humility, the humidity during the day, and because of certain, uh, you know, the, the weather, and because of the three months that it gets, this is actually what happens. And this is what David calls green pastures. So there's a rock with some grass shooting up. That is green pastures. That's what David's writing about. Doesn't it change your, the imagery that you have now? Midbar is actually called green pastures. That's what they actually call it in this region. And so here it is that it is believed that King David fleed into this place when he was running from King Saul and his son Absalom for his life. And now at this certain part in King David's life, he's sitting down and he's writing out for you what it means that the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And what's really cool about that rock where the grass shoots up is that sheep are not that intelligent. They're not. They're not the smartest animals on the planet. Without a shepherd, they're everywhere and they'll just die. And actually, if you let the sheep go along the rocks, you know they're just eating away, and then you have them go in a circle, they'll eat all the greenery up that you just saw. And you know what happens? Do you think when it runs out, the sheep will move to the next destination? What do you think the sheep does? Well, the one leading the sheep, the lead sheep, is consistently looking <laughs> for where the next is. And they're just going to keep walking in a circle, walking in a circle, having just the time of their life. And then all of a sudden, when the sheep has to release or relieve themselves, the other sheep begin to eat what is released, and they die. You could have food right across the street and they'll just stay circling. But a good shepherd, a good shepherd keeps the sheep moving, keeps them moving because you don't want them to eat all of it up because you have to last for a long time. You have to know your environment. So they actually go about five miles in a day. And along that mountain, that last picture that you just saw with all the greenery, you'll actually see that there's like these trails across the mountain. And when you see these trails going across the mountain, that is where shepherds would have their sheep line up and they would go and that they would go right on where the cliffs are and they would begin to eat the grass. And you know what's also cool about that? Is the sheep is not looking up at the shepherd. The sheep eyes are looking down at what's provided for right now. And they listen to the voice of the shepherd. They're not worried about the cliffs. They're not worried about anything else. They're just worried about listening for the, sh the shepherd's voice. And as they begin to eat little by little by little by little, the shepherd leads them with his voice. Doesn't that sound familiar? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and another they don't follow that my sheep won't follow another that if you truly are in the flock of Jesus Christ I am not going to follow another shepherd because the Lord is my shepherd it does not matter what's coming against me it doesn't matter what the bank account looks like it doesn't matter about what's going on internally and all the depression and everything that's coming against me the only thing that matters is is that I got my ears open to hear my good shepherd because he's going to provide for my every Every single need every need that
that he will sit here and he will just allow us to look to him for our daily bread. So it is the sheep's, the sheep's job to follow the shepherd because the sheep, and this is another thing cool about sheep, sheep, the sheep that are on the outside, when they are skid, they're very skittish animals. They get very, they get very scared very easily. And the moment they get scared, the ones that are farthest away from the shepherd, what do you think they do? Do you actually think they run towards the shepherd or do you think they go the opposite direction away from him? They go the opposite direction. But here's the cool thing. The sheep that are near the shepherd and that are close, they don't go anywhere. They actually get closer to the shepherd. It doesn't matter my storm. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what my educational background is. It doesn't matter where my past is. What matters is, is what he says about me. And what matters is, is that when I'm going through life storms, I don't run away from him. I actually run to him and I stay real close to my shepherd. Because it's in that that I find comfort. It's in that that I know that he truly is my shepherd. I lack nothing that he will lead me and he will guide me into life's every need that I could possibly ever need or want. A rabbi once said, worry is like dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pastures. What are you worrying about today? Because tomorrow's not even here. What are you worrying about today that you're missing the provision that God has given you today and you're so concerned about, am I gonna, this is really good grass. Am I gonna get some of this tomorrow? We miss it. We get so bombarded with all this stuff that the world has thrown at us that we miss hearing our shepherd for today, that we miss it. And we miss the people that God has placed around us. This is why we say discipleship is relationship. We need each other because the ones closest to the shepherd, man, life group leaders, they're real close to the shepherd. We wanna get really close in community with people and do life with one another because life is so much better together. Because when a sheep has wandered away, woe to the sheep that is alone when a predator is on, at bay. What, woe. Why? Because that predator will take the sheep out. And the lamb, the most youngest sheep, what they'll do is if they wander away, they will sit down and they will not move. The, sheep, the shepherd has to go get them. Because if the shepherd doesn't go get them, they'll remain right there and they'll die. Shepherds will sit here and tell you that the only time that a, sh a sheep will not follow the shepherd's voice is when the sheep is sick. When the sheep is sick, it will not follow the shepherd. See, we have this thing called sin, and it causes man's heart to be dark, to think that we can do life on our own terms and our own ways, and we don't even hear the shepherd's voice because we're sick and full of sin. And that we can't even hear how good God has been to us because we're so bombarded with false doctrine, false lies, false everything else that we don't even hear the good shepherd's voice because we're sick and full of sin because man's heart is full of wickedness. God loves you so much that he wants to be your shepherd every day of your life. He wants you to look to him to provide the resources that you need for today. That I don't need to worry. Sheep are not worried about tomorrow. They're just excited that they get to follow the shepherd today because the shepherd has need. Doesn't it sound familiar what Jesus was teaching the disciples? Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you eat, drink, what you're gonna wear because the father knows exactly what you have need of. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
if the waters are not absolutely still. Sheep are so skittish that if the water is moving or if it's a river or anything, the sheep will not drink. And it can be almost close to dehydration and it will not drink, it will die. So the shepherd has to know where to find quiet or still waters. Because the shepherd also has to realize that flash floods in this region and even still today will kill people. And it takes flocks out all the time. And so this flash flood can happen at any moment. And how you know a flash flood is coming is because all of a sudden you see this water just running by. And so if a shepherd says, oh, look, running water and brings all his sheep and all of a sudden they don't realize that there's a flash flood on on the horizon and it wipes out the complete flock, including the shepherd. What flash flood is in your life right now? What flash flood is trying to destroy you that the shepherd cannot lead you out of? Because there's so many different needs and so many different things that we are going through, all of us. What is the one thing that you could sit here and say, you know what, it's that one thing. Or maybe it's like, you know, if God didn't deliver me from drugs and alcohol and all this stuff, I know where what I would be. But God delivered me from that flash flood. And he was my shepherd. And he led me out of the very darkest of the valleys. And he brought me to a place that I can hear his voice so clearly that it doesn't matter about what's going on around me what matters is he's before me and that he goes before me and I can follow my shepherd because he makes me lie down in green pastures because when a sheep's needs are all met guess what the sheep does he just lies down because he knows he can trust the shepherd are you lying down are you are you resting in the pasture of the Lord or have you left because something spooked you. Because life will try to spook you. Life will try to get you to leave the flock that God has placed you in. Life will come against you and all these storms and all these things will come bombarding just like a flash flood. One minute is great, next minute is like, oh my gosh, it's like chaos. But the beautiful thing that we have is we have a shepherd. That we have somebody that can lead us and guide us out of no matter what we would ever go through. See, verse three, it says, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. See, that path that, you, that I was telling you about on the mountainside, like the trails that you'll see, and you can go Google it. There's, it's just fascinating. But all these trails, it's very rocky and there's a lot of loose rocks, so it's complicated when you try to walk up. But the moment that you're trying to walk up all those rocks and all of a sudden you get to that, that path and it's like, it's the, the firm foundation. It's that path of righteousness. It's the right path that I need to be on. And even though there's a cliff, I'm on the path. I'm on the narrow path. Doesn't that sound familiar? Jesus said that it's the narrow path that you find life, not the, one, not the wide one, the narrow one. It's in the narrow path that you will find life and you will find it more abundantly when you follow the good shepherd, when you follow his voice. Along the right path, this word right in Hebrew is um, sedekai or sedek, sedekai, and sedekai is actually the root word for, and this is what the root word means in Hebrew. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It actually means standard we have with right relationship with God and other people. Most of us will sit here and say, oh, right path of righteousness, what comes to your mind? Oh, right living, behaviors. Oh, no, no, no. David was going deeper. He was saying that the path of righteousness for his namesake, that you will know that you're my disciples by the theology that you teach. No, that you will know that you are my disciples for the love that you have for one another. That it is in this path of righteousness that I am in complete right standing with God and with other people. How are your relationships? 
Do you have a small group, a life group? Or the reason why you don't go is you just feel that you can do life on your own. Or is it because people have hurt you in the past and you really don't want to open yourself up to get hurt again? What is the one thing that is keeping you from following his voice? For just saying, God, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to worry about all this other stuff. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, even though I walk through the shadow of death, even though I walk through this, I will fear no evil. I don't need to fear evil. Why? Because you're with me. You have a rod and you have a staff. And no matter the lion, no matter the coyote, no matter the foxes that come in to spoil the vine, it does not matter what is trying to come against me. All that matters is, is the Lord is with me. The Lord is guiding me. The Lord is protecting me. And I don't have to fear evil because evil cannot come against my shepherd. Because who I stand for and who I live for, I live for him. And he has already overcame it all on the cross. You will give up one day and put this body to rest and you will see the one and only Jehovah Jireh. You will see the one and only, the name above every name, Jesus himself face to face. I hope he's your shepherd when that happens. Because this life is ticking and you never know when it stops. See, the Lord is your shepherd providing guidance and protection in all seasons of your life. There's not a season that he can't protect you from. There's not a season that he cannot deliver you from. This word valley, when you look at this picture in this valley right here, that there's certain parts in this valley that's where if the sun is not hitting in the right spot, it gets so dark and the sheep get so scared. But when they're with the shepherd, they don't fear. It doesn't matter how dark the valley is. It doesn't matter how how bad it gets because guess with who they're with? They're with the shepherd. So what is the deep, dark valley right now that you're walking through? Because he's with you. He's with you. The thoughts of depression, the thoughts of suicide, the thoughts that you think you're cutting and it's gonna make it better, the thoughts of using drugs and alcohol. It real, no, I'm here to tell you that he's with you and he wants to lead you to a life more abundantly if you just take the daily provisions that he's given you and that you would just listen and tune into his voice and that just to know that I'm gonna focus on today and to hear his voice because that's the only thing that matters is his voice in my life because of our relationship that we have with one another. See, the Lord is your shepherd, providing guidance and protection in all seasons of your life. Brings us to verse five. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare. When Jesus, on the night he was gonna be betrayed, he sat down at a table <laughs> and his enemy was looking at him face to face. Can you do that? Could you sit down across from the table and have dinner with the very one that's been talking about you, lying about you, doing all these things, and could you still look them in the face and smile and love your enemies as Jesus has done? Because that is not easy, is it? But in the very presence of my enemies, my Lord will prepare a table and he will show me exactly what I need because he is more than enough. You know, going back to quiet waters real quick. The children of Israel were delivered from Pharaoh because out of one of the plagues was turning water into blood. Y'all remember that? And then he took the blood and he changed it back into what? Drinking water. Then they got to the Red Sea and they couldn't go forward because they couldn't go forward because the Red Sea was blocking them. Do you think they cried out in faith and said, oh Lord, great shepherd, we need a way. What did they do? They complained. They blame God. 
and he parted the Red Sea. All he wants is for us to trust. That's it. It's going to be hard here. This is not our home family. We have to leave. Everyone wants to go to heaven. No one wants to die. But he parted the Red Sea and he closed it on the enemies. They were so happy. Then a couple days later in Exodus 15, we saw when we saw the name, I'm Jehovah Rapha. There was no physical healing. But what he was trying to heal was the relationship because they came to a place with no water and the water was bitter. And instead of crying out saying, God, you changed the water to blood and you turned the blood and put it back to water and you parted the Red Sea and you closed the Red Sea and you did all this stuff. Lord, I surely know you could take this bitter water and make it drinkable. Will you do it? Did they do that? They complained. And they started accusing the very man that God was using to help them. This is our life. We're sheep. <laughs> he wants to take the troublesome waters in your life and to make something beautiful out of it as we trust him. As we trust and we obey and we say, Lord, I am going to focus on today and I am going to walk forward as I hear your voice because the Lord is your shepherd providing healing spiritually and physically. There's nothing he can't do. And this is why surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That I get to dwell with my shepherd forever. That I am listening to his voice now. And one day I'll look up and I'll get to see my shepherd face to face. Through all the pain, through all the stuff I've been through, through all the stuff you've been through, for the people you've lost, for all the people when you, when you thought God wasn't there, that you'll put your head down and say, God, just lead me. I trust you. I know you're gonna bring me through. And then one day, you'll look up after you put this body to rest and you'll see your voice, the one that's been leading you all your life, and you'll dwell with him forever 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 that the pains will be gone away in Colossians 1 15 20 it says the son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation that every name you saw every name I, Jehovah Jireh Rapha, this was Jesus himself. This was Yahweh manifested amongst all his people. Can you imagine with the religious leaders that accused him and crucified him and wanted him to suffer, where are they at today? And could you imagine what's going through their minds? That I saw him face to face and I missed it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it because life is short. You never know when it will stop. It says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him. That this was God manifested in the flesh, the full dwelling of God himself. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood shed on the cross. Thank God for a shepherd that would lay down his life for you and me so we could have the forgiveness of sins and we could hear his voice. There is nothing, no money, no nothing that is worth 
it. I would rather hear his voice. I would rather hear him. And you know how else he speaks? Through the rest of the flock. We need each other. We're family. We are family. Because when we die, there's no isolated heaven for you. We are together for eternity. We're family. It says in John 10, 11, what are we going to do something like this? And just, I'll leave with this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So what is the one thing I want you just to know before you walk out? This. Be like Christ and abide in his name. Because his name is above all other names in heaven and in earth. Abide in Christ. Abide. The storm's rough. Abide. When things are not going your way, abide. When things are not going exactly how you intended it, abide. Because when I abide and try to be like Christ, he'll lead me every step of the way. And I can surely say, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. How about you? Will you please stand with me? During our closing song, if you're struggling to hear his voice in the situation you're going through, ministry team, you can come on up. There's gonna be a team up here that wants to pray with you. And you know, no matter what you're going through and there's so many different needs and maybe you're saying, you know what? I don't even know the shepherd. I don't even know this Jesus thing. But you know, I, 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 I may wanna give him a try. I want you to come forward. Or maybe you're just in this storm of life and you're going through all this stuff and you just went to the doctor and you were hoping that you were gonna be healed and he came back with the diagnosis that it was actually worse. And that you're, te- you're trusting him and you're trying to push through. Or maybe there's some depression that you're dealing with. Or maybe you're even actually contemplating suicide because it just feels like death is better than life. I want you to come forward during this closing song. We are family And let us pray for you and believe that the shepherd will speak to you. Because that is our prayer, that you would hear the shepherd's voice and the power of the Holy Spirit every day of your life. God bless you and know that Jesus loves you. And he wants an everlasting relationship with you for all your life. Shake up the ground, say shake up the ground 
as I pray a blessing over you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, your family, and yours both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.